Happy New Year, everybody. It is good to be here. It's hard to believe 2023. I don't know about you, but 2022 was just like a blink. It went by quick. Before I get into uh, my opening, uh, Cheryl and Eduardo are in the house. I could hear them from the back, and I was blessed to have them. When I saw them, I was so encouraged. They're like our choir, and so I, I love it. I love it. So good to have you guys. We love you. But uh, again, Happy New Year. I always get excited, you know, as the new year uh, comes, you know, because the promise and the prospect that the new year brings, you know what I mean? As we're given what I like to believe a clean slate, you know, 2023 at this moment is a blank page. It's a blank page, right, to begin again. Whatever happened in the previous year, the new year provides you with the opportunity to do things differently, provides you with the opportunity to do things better, provides you with the opportunity to right maybe the wrongs that may have happened this past year, provides you with the opportunity to, to capitalize on the opportunities and the new open doors that God may have for you uh, this coming year and the things that are pre uh, presented to you in 2023. You know, I'm really praying that God would really bless us in 2023. You know, the, the word that God has given me for us this year is depth, depth and growth. That's really going to be our push this year. Last year, we were kind of focusing on evangelism, but the word that God has really impressed upon my heart is depth, that we would begin to grow deeper, our roots would grow deeper in Christ, and that we would continue to mature in our faith. Uh, and so I'm asking and believing God that 2023 is going to be a great year for that. And this morning, I want to talk to you about something to help set you up for a great new year. I, wanna, I pray that you would be blessed and encouraged. Those of you who didn't come, you're going to miss out because I believe God has a special word for you today. I really believe that. But, you know, uh, today, how many of you are excited about the, the new year? How many of you are excited about the new year? You excited? Amen. How many of you are ready to put 2022 behind you? Yeah. Yeah, you're just like, everybody's like, yeah, I want to get rid of that year. I mean, how many of you are excited to get a do-over? Yes. You know what? I tell you what, I think we all need do-over sometimes. Can you say amen? Today, I want to talk to you about winning. I want to talk to you about winning. How many of you like to win? Oh, just a few of you? Okay. I'll remember that when you tell me that you went to Vegas. <laughs> but you know that feel. I don't go to Vegas. I don't gamble. I really don't like that place. That's just not me. But I know that some of you will go and play a little blackjack and do things. But how many of you know that feeling when you're coming home with a pocket full of cash and you know like, man, I didn't have this. But there's something about winning. There's something about winning. You know what I mean? And and this morning, you might want to write this down because this is kind of the bottom line in case you miss anything else I have to say this morning. Winning is better than not winning. You guys agree? Winning is better than not winning. And I know this for a fact because I have been a not winner. I have been a not winner. It's never fun losing, whether it's in fun or in games or in sports or in business or in relationships, or in your personal life. It's never fun not winning. You know, there is something so exhilarating, so exciting, so elating and thrilling about winning. I mean, let's be honest. There's something exciting about that. You know, this past Christmas, you know, our, our family, as we always do, we get together, we have a meal together, everybody uh, exchanges gifts and all that, and we stuff our faces, we eat to our full but this year, you know, my, my, after all of that stuff, my daughter brought out the games. And as we were playing these games, they were so fun. And you guys know, as everybody's getting into the games, the oohs and the ahs and the, you know, just the, the fun of it. But, you know, as, we're, as everybody's playing, I always, I always get a kick out of watching those that are losing and those that are winning. Think about those that are winning. We played this game. It was crazy. There was money all over the table. And they had like a bunch of ones, but then there were a couple of big bills. And then we had to blindfold ourselves, and you had this spatula where you can't really feel the weight of the money, but it was hilarious. People are picking up the money or thinking what they were picking up, and it was just crazy, the, the yelling and the excitement everybody had. 
But again, I just get a kick out of those that win because the elation of it, the elation of winning, you can't help but get caught up in the moment uh, and the excitement when you're the winner. When you're the winner and you come away, especially in this game, you know, you come away with all the cash. Who got the 50? Who got the 20? It's exciting. You know, I think, again, you would agree with me, there is no greater feeling, no greater sensation or experience than winning at something. You know, aside from the competitiveness that some can go way off the deep end, maybe there's some of you like that. I'm not one of those people, but there are some people like that. But aside from that, winning is important. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. Winning is important when it comes to the arena that matters most. It is important to win. When it comes to the arena that matters most, and the arena that matters most, of course, is your life. Is your life. That's just the wind, don't worry, or the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to. You know, in the arena of life, winning is important, which leads me to a question that I want to raise today that I would hope that you would wrestle with, not just today, but that you would wrestle with this through the course of your life. That you would wrestle with this question, it's a simple question, but that you would wrestle with this question in the various seasons of your life, right? I believe it's a question that you need to often refer back to. It's a question that I ask our leadership and what we're doing here. A question that if you don't answer, listen, you will spend too much of your life, as King Solomon wisely put it in Ecclesiastes 1.14, chasing the wind, right, instead of winning, Right? This is a question that most people never ask, and consequently, a question that never gets answered. And if you don't answer it, again, life will begin to feel like a race that you feel the pressure to finish, but you're not sure where the course begins. Right? While everybody else seems to be running with purpose and direction, you're just running aimlessly. Right? Where life begins to feel like this game that you feel pressure to win, but again, you don't know the rules. You don't know the rules. So here's the question I want to ask. Very simple, but it's an important question that we need to ask ourselves, not just today, but every day, various seasons of our lives, and various times of our lives. And the question is this, what's the win? What's the win? It's difficult in any arena of life to know that you're winning if you've never identified what the win is. You guys hearing what I'm saying? How can you, I, how can you know what the win is if you haven't identified what that is? What's the win relationally? If you're in a relationship, what's the win for that relationship? You're in a serious relationship, you're dating someone, maybe you're close to being engaged, or maybe you are engaged and you're in love. And as great as that is, what's the win in the context of that relationship? What's the win? What's the win financially? Whether you admit this or not, all of us think about money all the time. None of us want to say that, but you think about money all the time. How to get as much as you can to make a living, to live a comfortable life, to prepare for your uh, retirement, to provide for your family. There's nothing wrong with that. But what's the win financially? What's the win for your family if you have kids? What's the win for your marriage? What's the win professionally? And I'm going to get in depth with some of these things more. But let me tell you why it's important to ask and answer this question. If you don't define the win for yourself, you'll end up adopting somebody else's win. You'll end up adopting what somebody else is doing, right? Listen to what I'm going to tell you, especially if you're single. You'll date like everybody else dates. You'll spend your money like everybody else spends their money. You'll spend your time like everybody else spends their time. You'll work like everybody else works. You'll parent either like you were parented or like everybody else parents. If you cannot identify the win, what's the win? What's the win? If you don't know what the win is, it's hard to tell if you're winning or not. Let me ask it this way. What's the win in this season? What's the win in this season? Because in every season of life, there are different wins. This is why this is a question that we need to ponder through the different times of our lives. Because 
different seasons provides different challenges. And so what's the win in this season? You know, in the book that we're going through in our men's fellowship, you know, it's called The True Measure of a Man by Richard E. Simmons. It's really challenged me to think deeply about my character, about my character, about what's important, to think deeply about who I am. And it's challenged me to think about what's the win for me? What's the win for me as it relates to who I am? As it relates to who I am and the person that I believe God wants me to become. You know, and, and if you, you know, the, those of you men who, who attend and you're able to, uh, you've been a part of it, you know how good this book is. But if you have not read this book, if you're a man, I want to encourage you to get this book, The True Measure of a Man. It's an incredible book. You know, but it's really challenged me to think about what is the win for me. And so, you know, as I was doing something, one of the things that God put on my heart personally to do is I came up with some words that I wrote down that I won't share with you because they're personal to me, but words that I wrote down that I, that I pray would define my life. If I get to the end of my life and somebody stands up at my funeral and talks about me and they describe me as any one of these words, that will be a win. That will be a win. I will have lived my life in such a way that I was the person that I always wanted to become. And so I wrote these words down. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do this. I'm just, I'm just telling you that this is something I did for me so that I was able to identify and define the win in my life. The point that I want to make this morning is this. You need to define the win for your life, right? You need to define that. Nobody can define, you need to define that. What's the win? I also did this because whether you realize this or not, how many of you know that when people think about you, words come to mind? When people think about you, words come to mind. When you think of your mother, when you think of your father, when you think of your brother or your sister or your, your brother-in-law, sister-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, husband, wife, kids, grandkids, friends, words come to mind. Words come to mind. Do you realize that when you come to mind, words come to mind, right? And the reason you know this is true is because when you think of other people, words come to mind. You think, he's so dot, dot, dot. She's such a dot, dot, dot. They're so dot, dot, dot. He's always dot, dot, dot. She's always, right? When you come to mind, words come to mind. That is a fact. Words come to mind. I'm, I'm looking at Pastor Steve. When I look at Pastor Steve, I think MacGyver. That's what I think. Those of you who don't know Pastor Steve, he's one, of those, he's one of the most handy guys that I know. He can fix anything. I kid you not. I call him up just so often it's crazy. I thank God that he lives close to me. I've locked myself out of the house. I've, you know, certain things have broken down. I'm like, hey, Steve, are you busy, bro? Can you, can you, can you get over here? But when I think of Steve, I think of MacGyver. I do. I really do. It's, it's hilarious. But when you come to mind, words come to mind. You know, this past Thanksgiving, our family, again, we got together for our Thanksgiving dinner. And, um, you know, as we're going around the table, we always give thanks. I have everybody kind of share their Thanksgiving. But this year, Kathy and I did something very different. Um, the Lord just put on our hearts to write down on this piece of paper a character trait for every person around that ter at, at the table. And we gave them these pieces of paper that there were words that we put down about a character trait of them. And they, they read these things. And as they read these things, it described a character trait of them that we were so grateful for. You know, but the point is, when you think of somebody, words come to mind. I mean, have you ever given any thought to what you want those words to be for you? I remember I handed my son-in-law his, and I saw his eyes kind of just bug open, you know, and I said, this is what I see in you, and I, and I, I thought he was blessed by it, but, you know, again, have you ever given thought to that, you know, what you want those words to be for you? Wouldn't it be a win to decide ahead of time and to order your life and your character in such a way that you define the win for you and who the who the people know you to be, wouldn't that be a win? I think it would be. And so again, it's so important that we define what the win is. Now, 
if you're a newlywed, if you've been married for a few years or married for over 30 years, again, ask yourself this question. What's the win? What's the win? Because I believe there's some marriages, they're kind of in a rut. You know, I hate to say this, but I see it. A lot of couples, you know what? They're no longer face-to-face. And when I say face-to-face, I'm talking about intimate partners. They may be shoulder-to-shoulder. Some are back-to-back. And sadly, some are just roommates. That's it. They're just roommates because they've gotten in this rut. They've gotten this rut. Why? Because you have not defined what the win is for that marriage, for that relationship. You know, for Kathy and I's marriage, a win is still enjoying each other's company and liking to spend time together. I mean, really. And not needing anyone else to have a good time. Because Kathy and I, we can have a great time, just us. We can go on a vacation, just us. We can go to dinner with just us. There's certain people that have to be around other people all the time in order to have fun. We don't have to. And that's a win for us. A win for us after almost 40 years of marriage still is, and I still am, the first and the last person uh, that we both want to see. I, she wa- I want her to be the first and the last person that I see, and I, and I believe that's true of her. That's a win for us. You know, that we still are best friends. That's a win for us. You know, when I was in um, Israel, I bought Kathy a ring, and I had it engraved with Songs of Solomon 6.3, and it said, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. And that's what our heart is. You know what I mean? That we would not stop being in love with each other. The win isn't, the win isn't, we never got divorced. The win isn't, you know what, we've gutted it out. That's not the win. Even though to some people that might be the win, but that's not the win for us. We've gutted it out, man. We're still married regardless of everything. That's not the win for us. A win for us, again, is still that we're best friends. You know, in this month, again, I tell you guys this every year, so you guys probably know it so well, but this month will be 38 years of marriage. You know what I mean? Which is crazy. It's nuts. But what's the win for your marriage? And you know what? I will let you applaud for that. You know why? Because today that is important. That is important that there are marriages that are model marriages that the grace of God is upon, that are still healthy, that are still vibrant, because it tells you that it can happen with God's grace, with God's help, with God's power, right? God can do that. But what's the win for your marriage? Let me ask those of you who are, how many parents are here? What's my question? What's the win for your parenting? Most parents don't ever find the time to ever think about this question. And so for a lot of parents, the win by default is to have perfectly behaved kids. That's their win, right? And because they've never taken the time to ask and answer this question, many will parent toward what they call behavior modification. Behavior modification. Or you will parent toward behavioral control. And when you, uh, basically what that is, is when your kids get out of control, you put them on timeout. Because that's the only way you can control them, right? And so that's how you parent. Behavior Uh, modification, behavioral control. Again, I can only reference our lives. For Kathy and I, we've made a great many mistakes, and so I don't want you to think that we were these model parents because we made a lot of mistakes. But I can tell you this. Kathy and I, our goal wasn't to have perfectly behaved kids, and they certainly were not perfectly behaved kids. Our goal was not to have perfectly educated kids, right? That wasn't our goal. Our goal was that they would come to know and love and serve God on their own. That it would no longer be the God of my father and the God of my mother, but it would be my God, my relationship with God. And so that when they started their own families, they would teach their children to love and serve God. And that's been our hope, to raise up a godly heritage. You know, as Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that has, you know, that's a win for us because today our kids are walking with the Lord. Our kids are serving the Lord. Our kids are serving with us. And that, to me, that is a win. 
I don't care. They could have, you know, all kinds of degrees to their name. They can have, they they could be the most wealthiest people, but if they did not know the Lord, if they were not walking with the Lord, that would not be a win for us. That would not be for a win for us. Along with that, a win for us as parents was also, um, and I don't have a Bible verse from this one, we wanted our kids to want to be with one another when they were old enough that they didn't have to be and that they would still want to be with us. And today our kids are in their 30s. I hate to pull your covers, but our kids are in their 30s now and they have their own families and they don't ever have to do anything that we tell them to do. But I like to believe, because I see it with my own eyes, that they like to be with each other. And they like to sometimes be with us. That's a win. That's a win. Once you decide what the win is, listen, it will change your parenting style. It would change how you do marriage. It will change the way you discipline. It will change how you steward your money. It will change how you do things, right? Once you decide, once you define what the win is, regardless of where you are on your faith journey, you need to spend some time identifying the win. Again, what's the win? It doesn't have to be perfect. It might even change. But you have to give some thought because in the arenas of life that matter most, you want to win. You don't want to come to the end of your life. And as a pastor, you know what? I've been by the bedside of many people who've stepped into eternity who were filled with deep regret, who were filled with deep remorse, who said things like, I wish I should have. I wish I could have. I wish I did this. I wish I didn't do that. You know what I mean? You don't want to do that. You don't want to come to the end of your life having the shoulda, coulda, would have because you did not take the time to define what that win is for you, right? As it's been said, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it all the time. If you aim at nothing, you will hit it all the time. Now, what I want to do with you for the rest of our time is I want to show you a win statement from God's Word. From the New Testament by a man who has influenced all of our lives, either directly or indirectly. Indirectly in that we don't know him personally, but directly in terms of his literature. You know, he really shaped, he really shaped all of our lives because of his words and because of the letters that he wrote. The person that I'm referring to shows up in history as the name of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. But after he became a Jesus follower, he uses his Roman name, Paul, whom we know as the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, right? Who, by the inspiration and the revelation of the Holy Spirit, would go on to pen more than half of the New Testament. I mean, more than half of the New Testament, Paul wrote by the inspiration of God's Spirit. And the Apostle Paul's win, and this might be an encouragement to you, but the Apostle's one. Apostle Paul's win is given to us in his first letter uh, to the Corinthian church. And his win was actually a response to a failure. And so sometimes, you know, we go through life and, man, there is that failure. There is that bump in the road that we, you know, that we hit. And things don't go the way we had hoped. And things turn out messy and ugly. But, you know, believe it or not, Those things can be your greatest lessons and can lead to your greatest wins in life as we're going to see as it did in the life of the Apostle Paul. His win was actually a response to a failure. It was a response to a loss in his life because he steps into history as someone with deep regret and remorse because he persecuted the early church that revolved around the Nazarene rabbi whose fame and teaching was drawing the masses and, and people were leaving Judaism just in groves. They were leaving the religion that Paul uh, was a leader of. And, um, of course, I'm referring to Jesus Christ. And so par- prior to Paul's conversion, his aim was to put this movement of Jesus followers out of business because it was disturbing the world order between the Jews and the Romans, and it was drawing people away from Judaism. And so what did he do? He started, because he had the authority to do it, he started rounding up all the Christians and having them arrested. He even had some of them tortured uh, 
to get them to abandon their faith in Jesus Christ and to go back to Judaism. You know, people actually died as a result of the Paul's efforts to extinguish the Christian faith. And this was the, obviously the result of him going too far. At the time, Paul believed that he was doing a good thing. He believed that he was actually doing the work of God. You know, but as he had his own encounter with Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, Paul began to realize, you know what? What I thought I was doing good was actually doing more harm. I was hurting people, right? And as a result, he feels this deep remorse, deep regret, because for the rest of his life, as he was seeking to uh, uh, declare the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, he would run into people whose families were either imprisoned or even killed as a result of his efforts. And so he steps into history as this person. And here's what he says. And this is after he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9. He says, For I am the least of all the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. I love that phrase, and it's a phrase that I've often referred to myself. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. In other words, what Paul was saying is, you know what? I can't change the past. I can't go back and undo what I've done. But God's grace to me was not without effect. In other words, God did not waste his time revealing himself to me. He says, no, I worked harder than all of them. What's he talking about? He's talking about the rest of the other disciples. I worked, uh, apostles, I worked harder than all of them. But he says this, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul felt like I, he needed to outwork all of them because of what he had done to those who became followers of Jesus Christ. The persecution, imprisonment, and those who even died. As, as you know, the Bible even tells us about a man in the book of Acts named Stephen who was put to death as a result of the Apostle Paul. And so here in 1 Corinthians um, you know, Paul begins to talk about why he felt what he felt. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verses 19 through 27, he explains what the win for his life became. Now, before I show it to you, here's my point. My point is not that you adopt his win. That's not what I'm saying, okay? My point is to show you what he says afterwards because what he says gives us insight into what we have to do if we want to win, if we want to win in the arena of life that matters most, then you need to pay attention to what Paul's saying. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19, listen to what he says. Long, kind of a long passage of scripture, but I want you to hear what he says because it's powerful. He says this, I am free and belong to no one, but I make myself a slave to all people to win as many as I can. Paul tells us what his win is. Paul's win is to win as many people to Christ as he could. That was his win. He says in verse 20, To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. I myself am not ruled by the law, but to those who are ruled by the law, I became like a person who is ruled by the law, and I did this to win those who are ruled by the law. What's he talking about? He's speaking about the laws of Judaism. He's speaking about the law of Moses. He's speaking about the Ten Commandments. Verses 21, to those who are without the law, now what's he talking about? He's, he's talking about Gentiles, non-Jews, that's us. To those who are without the law, he says, I became like a person who was without the law. I did this to win those who are without the law. But, I, but really, I am not without God's law. Look what he says, I am ruled by Christ's law. Now, this is a really important distinction. How many of you know what the law of Christ is? Paul is talking about the single command that Jesus gave at the Last Supper. He's talking about the single command at the last Passover that Jesus celebrated with his disciples where he gives the command and, and basically he tells his disciples this. He says, as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. That was the command that Jesus left them. He goes, I give you a new command. It's not really a new command, but that you love one another, that you love one another. That was the single law of Christ. That's why Paul gave up violence as a means to an end to further his cause. 
He says, I'm under Christ's law now to win people over with the love of Christ. You can't beat be people into the faith. We love people into the faith, right? Paul had it wrong. He was imprisoning people. He was, you know, threatening people. And he says, you know what, it, can't, it doesn't work that way. This is a great principle for us to really keep in mind when you're seeking to invite a friend, when you're seeking to witness to somebody. You do it graciously. You do it with the law of Christ, which is the love of Christ. There is nothing more attractive, and I think you would agree with me, than demonstrating the love of God toward people. There is nothing more attractive than that. There's nothing more, you know, um, appealing than the love of Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? And so that's what Paul was talking about. Verses 22, he says, To those who are weak, I became weak so I could win the weak. I have become all things to all people so I could save some of them in any way possible. Why? Why does he say that? He says this because I have a win that defines my life. That's what Paul was saying. I have a win that defines my life. Verses 23, I do all this. In other words, I've organized my life. I've ordered my life, my time, my resources, so that by all possible means, I might save some. Why? Because Paul identified what his win was. And that was his win, right? That people would come to faith. He says, because of the good news, and so I can share in its blessings. I do this because I want everyone to know what God has done in the world by sending Jesus. That was his win. That was his win. Now, what comes next is really what I want all of us to get because Paul clarifies something that we really need to get. Like I said, my goal is not that you would adopt Paul's win or that you would adopt my win. My goal is that you would understand what he's saying here because it's so important that you get. What Paul is saying and what we need to get is this. It's not enough to wish. It's not enough to want. It's not enough to desire. And so now he uses this sports metaphor that the people of his day completely understood because you know that the Olympics origi originated from, from the Greeks and from Greece, right? And so they understood what he was talking about. And because we're such a sports-oriented culture, we know exactly what Paul is talking about. And so he goes right into this after he talks about or after he defines his win to the people. And it looks like he's changing subjects, but he's really not, right? What he's expressed, you know, he's expressed the importance of knowing what your win is. But now I want you to catch what I'm going to say. Now what he does is he tells us the way to win. He says, okay, look, I've defined my win, but let me tell you how to win. How many of you want to win? Pay attention to what Paul says, because now he tells us how to win. In, in verses 24 of 1 Corinthians 9, he continues, he says, you know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Look what he says, so run to win. All those who compete in the games use self-control so that they can win a crown. That crown is an earthly thing that lasts only for a short time, but our crown will never be destroyed. Verse 26, so I do not run without a goal. Look what he says. I don't run without a goal. I fight like a boxer who's hitting something, not just hitting the air. Verses 27, I treat my body hard and make it my slave so that I myself will not be disqualified after I have preached to others. Here's the point he's about to make. In an in a athletic competition, the competition is obvious. The competition is obvious. In a race, how many of you know, if you've ever run track and field, which I have, right, they're lined up right beside you. They're right beside you. In other words, you always know how you're doing in relationship to the competition. Why? Because they're either next to you or if you're on a football field, they're lined up where? In front of you. And so you already know how you're doing in relation to the competition because they're right there with you, right? Again, you know how you're doing against the competition. But listen, when it comes to winning in life, listen to what I'm going to tell you. When it comes to winning in your life, when it comes to winning in your marriage, when it comes to winning with your kids, when it comes to winning financially, when it comes to winning dating, you know, in your dating or whatever, it's hard to tell why. Because it's not as obvious. It's not as obvious. 
Why? There's no scoreboard. There's no fans. There's no clock ticking telling you time is running out. It's hard to tell how you're doing. So here's what Paul is saying to us here. He says, live your life with the same urgency that athletes do. Live your life with the same focus. Live your life with the same intensity is what Paul is saying. That you would bring to a race. That you would bring to a competition. Right? There would be a clock. There would be fans where you would know who the competition was. Live in such a way that you win and you are playing by those rules. Look at athletes. Look at Michael Jordan. Look at some of the great athletes today and look at the discipline of their lives because if you want to win, you have to understand that. You need to understand that you have to pay a price. You have to pay a price, right, so that you are prepared to compete at the highest possible level. If you want to win, that's the mentality that you need to have. Because in an athletic competition, how many of you know there's always a price to pay? There's always a price to pay. Okay. Well, the same is true just as it is in any arena of life. There's a price to pay. You want to be a successful business owner? Guess what? There's a price to pay. You want to have a successful marriage? There's a price to pay. You want to be successful financially? There's a price to pay, right? You need to understand that, right? It doesn't just happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen automatically. In the arenas of life that matter most, there's a price to be paid. Everybody who wants to win knows there's a sacrifice. Everybody who wants to win knows that there's a focus that needs to be had, knows that you need to say no to things that not too many people say no to things about, right? Paul says, I don't fight like a boxer who just beats the air. Paul says, no. He says, I discipline my body. I make it my slave. Why? Because I have defined, I have identified what the win is for me. What is the win for you, 2023? Are you just going to cruise through this year once again with no thought? And just like, okay, it's another year. I'm alive. You know what I mean? What's the win for you this year? Right? You know, Paul's saying, look, I'm going to order my life, my time. I'm going to discipline myself to make sure that at the end of the day, even though I have to say no to myself, that I get there. I get to the place that I need to do. That's the way I'm going to live my life. Paul says, I have to do this so after I have preached to others, I myself am not disqualified. So here's Paul's bottom line. Here's his bottom line. I'm going to prepare and compete as if my competition is lined up right next to me or lined up right in front of me. That's what he's saying. I'm going to live my life with the same focus, the same energy as I was in this kind of a competition. Listen, because... I don't want to get to the end of my life and be disqualified because I wasn't prepared to go the distance. I wasn't prepared to win. I guarantee you, talk to champions, talk to winners, and they will tell you what their mindset is. You know what I mean? Um, who's the quarterback who retired and came back again? Anybody remember his name? What's his name? Tom Brady, yes. I mean, I've, I've watched interviews on this guy. I mean, his diet, what he does to stay in the kind of shape that he's in at his age, I mean, it's, it's insane, but he recognizes if I'm going to compete at this level, I need to have the strictest diet. I need to do this. These are things that have to happen in my life, right, if I'm going to be able to compete in the NFL, if I'm going to be able to continue to win championships at my age. I have to compete at this level, and this is the price that needs to be paid in order for me to compete on that level. I really believe if Paul were here, he would be telling us what we already know. You don't win by wishing. You don't win by hoping. You don't win by even just praying. You win by preparing to win. You win by preparing. But you'll never say no to yourself with the urgency you need to until you have identified what the win is. And so, again, what's the win relationally, financially, academically, professionally? What's the win? Are you preparing to win? Now, before I close, I want to continue my thought. I was talking to those that are single, and not all of them are here today because maybe they were out a little late last night, and I totally understand that is New Year's, New Year's Eve. 
But I, before I close, I felt led. I, I want to talk to those of you who are single, if you're single or maybe single again. If the win for you one day is to be in a meaningful relationship that would lead to a meaningful relationship with someone that you could do life with, listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. You can't date like most people date. You can't date like most people date. It can't be just that casual. It can't, you can't just do that, right? Because if you do that, then don't expect to have something. You can't do what everybody else is doing. If you want a marriage that's unlike most marriages, you can't date like most people date. It's so, it's so casual today, it's crazy. You know, I'm not trying to be a prude or anything, but man, people know each other for a day or two, and there they go. You know what I mean? They slip into the sack already. It's like, what is that all about? You know what I mean? You can't date that way. If you want to have a meaningful relationship you can't do that. This is why every once in a while when I'm talking to some of you who are single and who are telling me that some of your bad experiences that you continue to repeat over and over again, that should be telling you something. What is the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That just doesn't work, right? So you got to do something different. you got to do something different. This is what I will tell them sometimes. I will tell you, those of you who are dating, maybe... If you've been in a series of bad relationships, right, one, all of them have crashed and burned, or I've heard this, why do I always meet losers? Why do I end up with people that, you know, just, that are just messed up, that don't have focus, that don't have, you know, drive? What is that all about? If that's you, listen, maybe you need to take a year off of the dating game. Maybe you need to step off the playing field for a year and put yourself in the penalty box for a year, where you need to get your focus. You need to clear your head, clear your heart, clear your mind and your conscience so you can decide, right, when you do step back on the field with all the crazy competition that there is, what is the win? What is the win? You got to think about that. You got to think about that. You know, what is the win? And the win can't be, he asked me out on a date. The win can't be just an experience. That's not the win. That's not the win. The win is bigger than that. The win is a marriage that stands the test of time, that brings glory to God, that that brings you the fulfillment that God has intended that relationship to bring you. But in order for you to experience that, listen, You can't date like everybody else dates, right? You can't do that. If you do that, then expect to repeat the things that have happened to you over and over and over again, right? If you don't want your dating history to continue to repeat itself, then you need to change what you're doing. So when it comes to the areas of life that matter most, and you know what those are, don't run like somebody who's running aimlessly anymore. Number one, Know what the win is for you. Number two, clarify your win with a win statement. Number three, figure out the how of the win. And number four, live with the expectancy to prepare to win. I'm preparing to win. At the end of the day, it's these kind of people that bring and that make the biggest impact in the world because they have this kind of focus. Right? I want to close with a poem as I wrap up this morning. It's, it's, it's entitled, Be a Winner. How many of you want to be a winner? I think we all do. But it says this. The winner always has a plan. The loser always has an excuse. The winner says, let me help you. The loser says, that's not my job. The winner sees answers for every problem. The loser sees a problem for every answer. The winner says, it may be difficult, but it's possible. The loser says, It may be possible, but it's too difficult. A quitter never wins, and a winner never quits. I don't know about you, but my challenge to you this morning is, you know what? Let's make 2023 a win. You guys with me? Let's make 2023 a win. But that doesn't happen by accident. That doesn't happen by coincidence. That happens because you intend to do that. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the exhortation. I pray that as we step into the new year today, Lord God, that all of us, Lord, would recognize the importance of defining the win, the importance of preparing for the win, Lord God, the, the importance of seeking you and all of it and knowing your heart for us, God. And so today I pray for that one, Lord, who is contemplating, possibly all of us who are contemplating these things, Lord, as we've entered in a new season, a new chapter, a new year, God. Prepare us for the opportunities. Prepare us for these encounters that we're going to have, for these people that we're going to meet, Lord, the things that you're going to put in front of us, Lord God, help us to seize the opportunities, knowing that there are seasons of opportunity that are not always going to be present. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be focused and clear-hearted and minded and prepared to enter into all that you have for us. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want to address myself to maybe that one who's watching or maybe you're here today and you have never made a decision for Christ. Let me tell you where the wind begins. The wind begins right there. The wind begins at the foot of the cross. The wind begins where you say, you know what? I've been in the driver's seat of my life and I've taken my life in the courses that I wanted to go and because I've done that, I've made a mess of my life. But you know what? I'm tired of uh, not winning. I'm tired of losing. I want to win. And so, Lord Jesus, I want you to take the driver's seat of my life. If that's you today, if that's you, if you're watching or you're in this place, you know what? You can have that. You can invite Jesus into your life, and he could be the author of your life now, where he becomes the driver of your life. And so today, before we have communion, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, it's not necessarily about the words that you say because God is really looking at the intent of your heart. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but if you can say these things and they can have no meaning. But if you say them with your heart fully engaged, then Christ will respond and he'll take residence in your heart and your life. And so today, if that's you, I want you to just, as I lead you in prayer, I want you just to quietly to yourself. Lord Jesus, Lord, I, I can't say that I understand it all, but today I know that I haven't been the winner that I wanted to be, and Lord, I need you, Lord, and so I invite you, Lord, in my life to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Today, as best as I know how, I confess you as Lord and Savior. I thank you that you died for my sins that you rose again and from this day forward Lord I ask that you would help me to serve you to walk with you and to apply your truths to my life that I would experience the kind of wins that I'm coming to realize that only come from following you and so Lord Jesus I pray this in Jesus name Amen as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed Lord, I pray for every person here as they're contemplating their lives, as they're contemplating their futures, as they're contemplating the things that need to be changed. Give them the courage, give them the strength, give them the grace to do the things that you've called them to do so that they can experience the kind of win that we can have in you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.